Hello, and welcome everyone to another Uncle Bobby's virtual author event. I'm so, so happy that so many of you are tuning in right now for this discussion of this long awaited book called Black Futures. It's a collection of essays and artwork which examines how creativity relates to black cultural identity in all its forms. We have its co-creators, Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham here tonight. And I'm just, I'm so, so, so pumped to share this book with the world. So really a big thanks to everyone who showed up. Uh, you're in for a real, real treat. Um, if you haven't already, you can get your copy of Black Futures by clicking the green button below the screen. Uh, that'll take you to Uncle Bobby's online bookshop. Um, for Philly residents, you are also welcome to come by the store and pick one up yourself. Uh, I think Black Futures will make a really dope holiday gift. Um, as always, after the discussion, the floor will be open to audience question and answer. Um, over the course of the conversation, please feel free to submit your questions using the Ask a Question module at the bottom of your screen. That's it, folks. Let's do this. Allow me to introduce our moderator for the evening. Tiana Nikia McLaughlin lives and works in North Philadelphia. She's a visual artist, filmmaker, and curator whose work explores and critiques issues at the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and social commentary. Tiana's exhibited and screened work at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Philadelphia, at the MoMA, at the Whitney Museum, and a slew of others. Please welcome Tiana Nakia McLaughlin. Where is she at? Uh, yeah. What up? Hi, Tiana. Hey. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. All right. And now for our featured co-editors. Kimberly Drew is a writer, museum curator, and activist. She received her BA from Smith College in Art History and African American Studies. Um, during her time at Smith, she launched the Tumblr blog, Black Contemporary Art, which has featured artwork from nearly 5,000 Black artists. Jenna Wortham is a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine. Uh, she's also the co-host of Podcast Still Processing, and um, as well as a sound healer, Reiki practitioner, and herbalist, all of which she lovingly practices on Kimberly Drew. Uh, she's currently working on a book about the body and disso dissociation. They both live in Brooklyn, apparently only blocks away from each other. Please help me welcome the creators of Black Future, Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> welcome. So happy to have you. All right, you guys, do your thing. Thanks for being here. All right. Yeah! <laughs> I don't know. The first thing is like, I just want to say I'm so proud of y'all. This thing blew me away. Blew me away. Yeah, it's just, it was such a, like when I got it, I was like, how in the world did they do this and still be themselves <laughs> in the world? So yeah, I just want to say that congratulations. And this is, this is amazing feat. It's teaching me a lot. I'm still working through it, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, oh. How y'all feeling? Which lay? <laughs> There's a lot going on. The universe mm -hmm. is taking its time beating our asses. Um, <laughs> 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 um, but it's really such a gift to be here. And um, just a very special shout out to every single person, nearly 200 of you who are sat at a computer or phone or some sort of device. I saw some friends were projecting last night, um, the good kind of projecting. Thank you all so <laughs> much for being with us in this book journey. Um, we'll get you know into conversation about the book, but I mean, to answer to like how this was possible and being real people, it was the community of folks who supported us, um, whether we've made direct connection or not, there is such an incredible bolstering energy and light force that I think this book has been bathed in from its very early conceptions. Um, and so thank you all for showing up for this leg of it because yeah, it's just, it's so wild to take a thing that exists in word documents and <laughs> turn it into a book that people have and their children hold and take photos of. And um, so we're just here 
you know, humbly to talk about it. And this is the best part, right? Like this has been the juiciest part, like not the nights in Dropbox and, you know, getting, you know, who emails at 6 a.m. from our publishers and just all the admin. But this is the part that feels so good is, is being able to share it with the people we care about the most and inviting them to come talk to us. And it feels so juicy. And, you know, jury's still out on whether we would do it all over again. But this part feels so good. So it means a lot that y'all are here tonight. Cool, cool, cool. So um, where do you all want to start? I feel like it might make sense to start with your questions. All and right. then we can talk about your contribution. Okay. So I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Okay. It'll flow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I mean, my first question is one uh, that really has to do with the undertaking of it all. Because, you know, I had the privilege of understanding it in idea form. Um, so I want to ask how much of this book is close to the original idea that you all had? <laughs> great question, Tiana, sorry. That is a great <laughs> question. That is a great question. That is what happens when you have someone who's known you for more than a decade. <laughs> but yeah, but see, this is the thing. The reason why I'm asking it is because as an artist, right, my biggest place of conflict is like that head to the hand moment mm -hmm. because there's something that just starts to kind of like get complicated and fade away. But with this, I'm so like, I'm overwhelmed by it because it's huge, but I want to know really where it was in the idea form versus where it is now, like how you feel about that. Yeah. Jenna, do you want to start? I'm happy to jump in. I mean, it's occurring to me that I should pull up the original proposal from mm -hmm. early 2015 and just like take a gander. Cause I know we have it and I save everything. I have it. Um, and I mean, the it's, I think we really didn't know what we were doing. And I, I really say that with like full loving awareness, like we really did, could not understand the scale of the undertaking. We could not understand the length and the duration of the project. But also I think we just, had an idea and really were lucky to sell that idea, but then just kind of let it continue to evolve. And I think the project's, you know, moral compass, its gravitational pull, I think what was in its orbit, you know, shifted over those five years. I mean, a lot happened. I mean, we grew so much as people. Mm -hmm. And I think the things that became important to us evolved too. I mean, there's, there's a point in the process when, you know, um, I'm trying to remember how we came into like Fem Power in Miami. It was through our friend Becca, who's in the chat, but maybe Kimberly, you knew of them, or but we got really in invested in um, you know ideas circling around abolition, you know, and like that started to make its way into the book. There was a point in the process when we were getting our you know back to the land vibe on, and so like so that's when Soul Fire Farm starts coming in, and so it's interesting to see the evolution of. Initially, we were thinking we were going to collect essays and conversations, and obviously have images and artworks in the book, and then as our own kind of, you know, personal orientation and politic kept expanding, I think the book kept expanding too. And our ambitions for it kept growing too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I can completely echo that. I think today there, or yesterday, there was an announcement from The Sims, like the game, um, about their expansion of color palettes that were made available for people who were building out their Sims. And I know both Jen and I are active Sims players. And I think, in some ways I could, could point to 2015 as the origin point for this book and mm -hmm. how we came to make it. But then I also think about my, both of our respective like young, younger selves and then also current selves who play The Sims and you know look to people like Amira who's a contributor in the book and made this incredible piece of writing about the Black Simmer culture and is you know partnering with the brand to do this work through their incredible diligence um, as a thinker, as a community builder. And so there's so much of this text that I think originated long before it was a twinkle in either of our eyes. Um, and then it became this thing that like, of course we had to sell a book proposal. So we were like, we're gonna do this and then we're gonna do that and then we're gonna do that. And then you get into the making and it becomes a completely different kind of beast. Um, mm -hmm. One of the early iterations we were like, okay, what would it mean if we picked up from like 1994 and tried to move forward and realized that that was a little bit more ambitious than either of us could wrap around. And so it continued to evolve and change. I feel like even 
up until the very last moment, um, even the in the interior cover of the book, mm -hmm. um, like this decision was made like a few months ago. So yeah. it, the stress. Yeah. What? And we were like, what's it gonna be? The stress. <laughs> wow. The book is like a trust fall. You just kind of like, just hold on to your butts, you know? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. part of that too, though, is bracketed by we were working through a global pandemic and we were working through a lot of personal, you know, grief because we were we were doing the finishing touches of the book in J July and June. And so we're grieving. The world is imploding and mm -hmm. we're being asked, like, what do you think about this typeface for the inside of the book? And we're like, I, I don't know, bro. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, we care so much, but it's a lot. It was a lot. Somebody's honking outside. I'm in North Philly, so pardon me. <laughs> we have to normalize the fact that we're all working from our homes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, um, I guess the next question is part of like kind of just it's it's got a loaded intro just because I have these um texts here with me that I want to kind of like, you know, touch on to kind of arrive to a place of discussion. But um, you know. I'm, I'm aware that you all are influenced by the Black Book, which was for me as a kid in South Carolina, like heavily checked out at the city library um, in Greenville, South Carolina, which helped me expand the idea of what one could be in various ways. And I felt so affirmed in to be able like to even share ideas around recipes to see like the actual songs that I've heard sung in these, you know, odd places. But there's another text, you know, I think that um, I wanted to bring in to kind of just give people an idea of like what these kind of bodies of work have looked over, you know, looked at over time. There's a text called, I don't know if you know it, Negro by Nancy Kennard. Um, huge uh, publication. I have like a new, like second edition of it or something like that. I don't have the first edition. Uh, yet. Um, it's published in 1934. Nancy Kennard is, um, you know, was a rich heiress. And it was a collection of like essays, songs, um, you know, it features one of the first essays um, uh, or one of the first mentions of like the juke joint. It's an um, essay by Zora Neale Hurston um, that's called The Characteristics of Negro Expression. And um, throughout this, uh, you know, text, you can see that there's a collection of these writers, poets, you know, composers, and but I think there's something very interesting about like what what happens with Black Book because this is devoid of images, right? It's a lot of text, heavy, heavy, heavy text. A couple of images. What happens with the Black Book in regards to like the you know not only the textual experience but you know diagrams, like you know it's like a teaching device. And I'm thinking also you know then we have your you know text which is doing even going even further and like like matching the times but also allowing a certain kind of like um you know space almost akin to exhibition space you know what i mean it like does not challenge the work that the, our respective practices hold and i wanted to you know think about like what it means to have um proximity to the community because you know Again, first text, Negro, 1930s is, you know, put together and edited by a white woman. You know, Black Book is, you know, organized and edited by Toni Morrison, right? And then here you are, you know, Kimberly, Drew, and Jenna Wortham pulling this together. What does it mean to have a certain kind of proximity to the subject? And um, what are, you know, I kind of want to get deep into it, like the pros and the cons, like, you know, into how you can kind of get... <laughs> Maybe like maybe you need someone to maybe say, hey, this this is you need to reel this part in. But what does it mean to really have proximity and to have so much uh, care and uh, love for something that also has to be edited? All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jenna, do you want to go? I can go. OK, great. Um, I mean. I mean, that's part of the thing that's really uh, been so impactful as part of this process. I mm -hmm. think there are so many um, radials off of this book, right? Like there, mm -hmm. are, there were essays that were chased down that got lost. There were, 
you know, there's all these journeys that we've been on with this matrix of contributors and matrix of people who are in support and matrix of people who we want to make deeply proud, yourself included. Um, and I think it's been such a journey. And I think one that like we're very much still steeped in mm -hmm. without to hold that responsibility and that vulnerability and that humility all at once, um, because you want to finish something and you also want something to be legible and you also want something to be authentic. And so how do you make the space for people to write in free verse or for images to appear at a lower resolution or, um, you know, embedding things in spaces that maybe they shouldn't be embedded, mm -hmm. including, you know, in your conversation with Shawnee, including screenshots from Xtube, which like is interesting, you know, in terms of like the way that we have been canonically kind of recorded and included and sometimes sanitized as a people, what does it mean to make sure that we're, as editors, taking on that responsibility of inviting the intricacies, complexities, and the messiness of what it means to be Black and alive. Um, but I think on an interpersonal level, it is incredibly difficult. Like mm -hmm. trying to keep on top, it's the two, it was the two of us. And we had multiple assistants throughout time. And that is a whole other conversation but trying to find the like expert time management skills to execute this is a is just it was harrowing but i think i I've, I've been as an editor really thankful for the moments of incredible connection and connectivity that i've had and the humility and the times of getting called in with people who are like this is irresponsible the way that you've done this like i welcome all of those things um but it definitely is humbling and i think that's what's made this next process of sharing so deeply difficult because it is this invitation to be viewed by everyone. You know, the, the folks who know absolutely nothing about the work that went into it, the folks who we went to as contributors to be a part of it, um, the scale of that interaction and engagement is a lot to wrap the mind around. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it has grown both of us and our bond and being able to support each other on the other side of that too. Um, so we don't feel like monsters all the time because it's really, easy. Um, it's been, it's been quite a journey. Mm -hmm. Jenna. Jenna. Yeah. To all that. I mean, I would just add to that. I think there's this, deep, deep, deep investment in the project that I don't know is always apparent from the outside because there really is no difference between this project and something that comes together in under a month, really, like in terms of like how, the way things get leveled when they come out online and how people receive them. And I always think of this moment when I was um, working in the newsroom and I was like a hardcore news reporter and I spent like, I had this like wild day that's like just like in the movies where someone's like, you a cub reporter? And I like went out in the world and wrote a story, turned it in and made the front page of the New York Times. And then the first thing somebody tweeted me was like great blog posts. And I was like, oh yeah, like in your mind, it's the same thing, like mm -hmm. it's the same thing. And I just have to accept that. Um, and so I think also just kind of grappling with that and you know, in terms of this question about care, you know, it's, it's you know, Kimberly and I deeply, deeply, deeply care about so much, every single detail that went into the book. There was a lot of, you know, we would have conversations sometimes about how to reach out to people. And, and I, you know, I still don't know if everybody's happy with their contribution or how it turned out. And, you know, we were talking with Naima Green last night and, and she was showing this incredible portfolio of her work. And none of that's in the book. We asked her to submit something totally different. And mm -hmm. the way that her, you know, purview and career as an artist has totally shifted in the last six months. I mean, I, you know, I think she's happy to be in the book. I think she likes it, but, but it, it, it keeps me awake at night because I think, you know, we want everyone to feel really good about this thing that we made and it's, it's fundamentally impossible. But I do think a lot about the thing I'm grateful for, which is that working on this project totally reshaped how I show up in the world. And anytime something can do that, like just, like I just feel like my eyeballs got flipped inside out and I'm grateful because I see things in a new way. And Kimberly you tweeted um, some time ago, I don't remember, but it was about, you know, pretty, pretty please be mindful when you're asking people who just released a project, where's part two? Because we're, get, we're getting so far ahead of even being able to stay in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking about how when I was doing more interviewing work, 
like that to me was such a cheeky, like I was always going to ask that. Like that was just like an easy throwaway question. I might get something interesting, probably not, but I had no way to rationalize or understand how that might feel to someone who's just put in everything to an album, everything into a film, every everything into a book, how the hell that question feels. And now that I have that perspective, I am forever reshaped. And those are just the moments in life that I, like I live for because I'm like, I did not know, I didn't know. Now mm. I know. <laughs> and this book has just been such a trove of new knowings. Um, mm. And one thing else I'll say is that one thing Kimberly, 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 oh my God, Kimberly and I learned throughout this process is, you know, I don't know if any one of us, either one of us will ever be late for a deadline ever again, because the feeling of walking into a party or into a space and having people run from you. And we're just like, no, 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 no. Like I'm not here to talk to you about work. And like, I don't, I trust you. It's coming. Like, I don't, I don't need you to, to, to account to me in that way, but like having, seeing other people melt a little bit because they are experiencing some part of a guilt shame spiral was mm -hmm. like the most unpleasant thing. <laughs> so I'm just like, I never want to do that to anybody ever. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that I would want to say is that the beauty of releasing it in this moment, especially when we're all relying so much on this, you know, kind of mitigated interaction through the online sphere is that it prompts you to look further. So whatever you felt mm -hmm. had to be left on the cutting room floor, which I'm pretty sure it was a lot, it's, it just implores you to learn, want to learn more about each artist. Like I'm kind of working it my way through it that way of like learning so much about all these different artists who are working in all these forms. Um, and that's really all that we, I mean, not all that we wanted, we, want, we wanted many things. Um, but I think for us, and one of the things now that we're here in this like, you know, the internet is complicated, but in this black mm -hmm. space, we've fielded a lot of conversations about what does this book mean to a non-black reader? And, and mm -hmm. in what ways does this book become um, a part of like a larger cultural moment? And I think it's it's refreshing to hear that from you as someone who I know knows a lot. <laughs> That's not the most eloquent way to say it, but as a, as a student and us as students um, and many people as students, um, regardless of their cultural background or socioeconomic, all mm -hmm. that other things that are wrapped up into who we are. Like this book, much like um, many other spaces of culture is for learning. Like mm -hmm. one of my biggest gripes in life as like a former museum person is that people feel like they have to have an understanding of a particular choreography or a base knowledge to be able to enter into a gallery space. And much like libraries and much like other you know, institutions of learning, that's at their best what museums should do for us. It should be about being completely enveloped in new information and finding and charting a path through that. And with hopes through the in, like incredibly valuable work of museum educators and guards alike, you should be able to leave those experiences more fulfilled and more nourished. Whether you like it or not, you're mm -hmm. gonna learn. And so I think for us when creating this book, for, of course, for Black people and on behalf of Black people, um, the hope is that everyone who comes to this text will leave with that imbued sense of curiosity. Because I think more often than not, we're denied an imagination. Claudia Rankin writes so brilliantly about this, but like we deserve to be imagined about. We deserve to be completely and utterly dumbfounding and completely like, yeah, there's um, a speculative nature to our existences that should be respected and regarded. And I think we try to hint at that in this universe of this text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you and also disrupting the monolith of what blackness can be. I, I think the biggest thing I like are the contradictions. I love like something that's just like, kind of like messy and defying the idea of what can be in one thing. And that's, I think a great thrill with this text. Cause I mean, you've got a lot of us together. Some of us don't even fuck with each other. Right. So. <laughs> like, I'm just saying, but it's like the beauty of that is that I'm just I'm with it because I'm like in this space, we are really fucking with each other. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like and it, and it makes sense. And it's like, you know, I, I like being in this space, you know, with, uh you know, um, folks work and causing having these like this <laughs> private moment of thinking about how we fit together. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> 
keeping it real. <laughs> so much drama. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, a gift and a curse for this moment. Could you imagine us all in the room? That's the best kind of thing, a complete riot. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a complete riot. I like that, though. It's good. It. It's good. There's I love love and breakups. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, lordy, lordy, lordy. But it's, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. You know what I mean? Like to have that, you know, because I think that's what my, you know, I'm coming, uh, my excitement about even being able to talk to y'all is I'm such a lover of books. I'm surrounded by them and, you know, literally in the process of trying to take some books out of my own living space to my studio. And that's kind of like where I first interacted with art, you know, like, you know, growing up in the South in a certain kind of way, just didn't have access to go to museums and look at things. So, that was my first glimpse of, you know, possibility. And so I'm just thinking about um, how big and how overwhelmed, the pleasant, overwhelming feeling that, you know, both youth and also elders could uh, feel when they see this, you know what I mean? So. I definitely have a friend, um, an herbalist friend, um, Arvalyn Hill, who does um, at Goldfeather is her herbalist shop and she's amazing, but I guess she ordered the book to her mom's house and then she, her mom's in Connecticut and she's living uh -huh. in Harlem. And uh, she was like, my mom won't give the book back. And I was like, so, tell your mom to text me a picture of her with this book. I need to know what she likes about it. And her mom was like, like give my copy. And I was like, let her keep it. Let her keep it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love. It's, it's a good way to be learned about, you know what I mean? It's a really cool way. Mm -hmm. So where do y'all want to go next? I mean, I got like heavy hitter questions. I want to do it though. <laughs> want it you want I'm it. I mean I mean the one thing just because I'm interested in like what is the more um so I have a couple like what was the most surprising submission because I mean you I know that you all like in a way of like kind of curating and trying to like shape an idea you like have a certain kind of expectation of artists or idea of artists but what was something that surprised you when it like came to your inbox I can go actually, because I was just flipping through the book to see what, what just, mm -hmm. you know, like a tarot deck, like what's going to reveal itself. And um, gosh, I can't remember where in the trajectory of the book we <clears throat> licensed this essay, but there was this essay that ran an aperture on Zadie Smith on Dina Lawson. And we yeah. excerpted parts of it and asked for all these images, which, you know, were fine. And then the book took two, you know, two more years after that or whatever. And so we had this like panic moment where the one thing I'll say I really learned from Kimberly was, you know, about practicing that care because I, I don't come from that any any art or museum or gallery space. So like I I, you know, I had to kind of reorient myself in this way. And Kimberly was very good about like, let's just check in that, you know, a lot of time has passed. How are people feeling about their contributions? Like let's think about where pieces are going side by side, like all of that stuff, right? which I really appreciated. And it was like, of course, but reaching out to the team, they were like, oh no, no, no. Like we're not gonna license seven images anymore. Like you can only have two. And hmm. we were like, the book's about to go to print. So which two, because we need to like take them out. And one of the images was just this one mm -hmm. from Dina's portfolio. And I just, you know, it's called Portal. It's called Portal. And like, I know this tear, I know this couch, I've seen it. I've seen it in family members' homes. I've seen it in friends' homes. And mm -hmm. I just, you know, we were like, it's actually perfect. And it has its own place after the essay. And it was a, it was an unexpected surprise. But I think what surprised me was that something that came out of a subtraction and a moment of stress ended up being such a source of delight. And that really mm -hmm informs me about just the process of making something with collaborators and, and the value of surrender in that. Cause you have an idea about how things are going to go. It may not be possible, but there's, there can sometimes be incredible beauty in mm. that end game and that disruption. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I'm <laughs> like, I feel mischievous. I feel very surprised um, by, we have like two photos of Barack Obama in this book. <laughs> <laughs> and it just tickles me, it really does. Uh, because that wasn't really the intention, but we I think, have fun. yeah, like we, we had a really beautiful chat um, or, I mean, I guess it will be shared later. We did this really beautiful conversation with Eve Ewing 
um, who we love and has a beautiful poem um, to incarcerated youth in the book that's paired with these beautiful photographs by Zora Murph out of Arkansas. And um, we were having a conversation about what it means to create a book and how that's not everybody's medium of engagement. And how can we? How do we think about um, accessibility, lowercase a, in in sharing this with a larger audience? And I thought about our book in this way that I think about my mother's kind of like corners of the house that are dedicated to the Obamas, mm. um, which will never come down. Like my mom mm -hmm. rides for Michelle Obama like so hardcore, and I think a lot about even you know, for us in some small way. I hope that this book is something that sits in a corner that, in that way, or maybe, you know, like so many people have shared online, like really staged and beautiful photographs of of their their copy of the book on beautiful textures and fabrics or in a stack with other books that mean something to them. And I think about Barak in that way, where I'm just like, his presence in the book just makes me laugh because it wasn't intentional. And I think he's such, you know, especially in this moment, this media moment is so complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but of course he's so important to us as black Americans and I think black people on a global scale. Um, but it just tickles me when I see it because Wesley's incredible essay about the portraits is so mm -hmm. valuable. Um, and then we have this really beautiful portrait of him and then also the people who were present for this march at the Edmund Pettus Bridge um, in one of the chapter openings. And so I think that to me still kind of just like, it just tickles the fuck out of me because he's so complicated and we're like, we're not gonna have Badak's words, but we will have Badak's image and <laughs> respect the difference. But you know, Kimberly, it's interesting because something that's come up a lot in our conversations too is, you know, how abundant this year has been for material ideas and content, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think we very much included those pieces in a 2017 mind frame and mindset. And I think if we were working on this book right now, we very much would be thinking about, okay, well, who who could be the one to tackle this very complicated legacy in this man's ass, this damn book, you know? I think we would really be able to talk mm -hmm. about it in a way that maybe privileged some of those complications as they emerged, but at the time, you know, thinking about Wesley's, you know, cause Wesley's essay is not about Barak. It's about him going through the National Portrait Gallery and the way you have to walk past all these dusty old white men and then you turn around, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not even about Kehinde's piece either. It's really about his experience. And then where they had Michelle because they had Michelle, you know, by the restrooms mm -hmm. and we actually put them on ice, put them on blast on our podcast about it. And then we got an email and they were like, oh no, no, no. That's just because there were so many people waiting in line. We wanted to be convenient to the restrooms, but we moved her. Like we were, we were in the process of moving her anyway, mm -hmm. which is shady AF, you know, but I think it's, it's really just a testament to how much this book is such a, and I, I think that's why we keep talking about the time frame we made it in because it is such a time capsule of this production period within which we were working. Mm -hmm. I have one, like one more, just short little question that I think is just like a from a, like a design standpoint. Outside of the black book, like what is one text that each of you maybe took a little bit of referential um, ideas from that maybe impacted you that you felt like you know this book has to this text has to do this as well. For me, it was Jeff Chang's "Who We Be," because I swear on a like scripture i got that book and was so to this day like i can't believe this person made this book before i could mm. and i really like stand jeff chang so hardcore um i put my black features underneath my copy of who we be in this like <laughs> hopeful like you know it's the same thickness and the same color um but i think that what jeff was able to accomplish in that text which i'll drop in the chat um in a conversation about the ways that images impact us and thinking about the history of archiving and including so many incredible artists um, for a really what I hope and believe to be a really open-ended conversation around visual art um, and really approachable conversation around visual art was really important because I think I just get fresh, especially like the further and further I get from working in institutions in the arts, I just don't want to touch any project that isn't inviting and isn't inclusive and isn't constantly challenging the infrastructure. Um, and I think that his book, which I think came out in 2014, does that really excellently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, for me, I keep bringing this book up and I don't know why I didn't mention it in our acknowledgements. I think it was just like the train had left the station. But um, I think a lot about um, Claudia Tate's Black Women Writers at Work. And I need to get a new copy because my copy is so, I've broken the spine, like I paged through it so much. And um, it's Claudia interviewing every single writer you would ever want to hear from, you know, Gloria Naylor, Tony K. Bambara, uh, Maya, Nikki Giovanni's ass, who says some wild shit, not surprising, <laughs> Alice Walker, like, and it's so, it's, I was reading it last year, um, really, really in depth, or yeah, like the beginning of last year. And um, it's, all the interviews take place right at the, the turns from the 70s to the 80s. And, you know, there was very much this kind of souring or fermentation of idealism and hit hard hitting with this, this like new era of hard economic realism. And they're coming up on like the, what we now call, I guess, the crack epidemic. And, you know, it was just a complicated term, but like really grappling with what does it mean to understand the ways in which the government is like seeding our communities in this way to diminish and suppress and oppress. And like, we, you know, we feel powerless and, um, but also like coming out of the, this incredible wave of just like, you know, for color girls had just been on Broadway for that incredible run and just reflecting on it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's all these questions that are really cr crystallized at this moment in time. And there are these questions about process, but it's really about like, what are your concerns right now um, in this day and age? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you thinking about? What's on your nightstand? And I love it so much in, in the same way this book, you know, I, I ended up going through an underlining where there, she asks all of them, like, what are you reading? And like every single book they were reading, you know, I put into a bookshop cart or whatever was, you know, eight books, whatever I was using at the time to start like, okay, I need to read all these books. And I think that really inspired a lot of the conversations in this book and just recognizing like, they won't be, they'll be flawed, like they won't be perfect. They won't necessarily feel like maybe, I mean, to me, it's wild how much of, of the material in the book is now relevant, you know, has come back full circle. But even thinking about like Rembert Brown and Ezra Edelman talking about Colin Kaepernick, so much shit happened with Colin Kaepernick from the time that conversation took place mm -hmm. until the time the damn book came out. But when you read it, you know, they're having this conversation about him, um, the gesture that he made, right? And their immediate responses to it. And and that is an incredible thing to just have in a book. And Colin is not someone we were, I mean, we were like, how do we engage with this person? Like, how do we have them in the book? And how do we think about, you know, this this act? And it's it's one of my favorite things. And so is your conversation, you know? And I think it's it's one of the things that I just, I don't know, like it, it's that text I refer to all the time. And so I'm hopeful that the conversations in the book outlast in a similar way. Yeah, yeah. On that note, I kind of wanted to ask you how you feel, not necessarily how you feel about your conversation, but if you could talk a little bit about your conversation for those who haven't accessed it yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so relevant, especially in this moment. Like, I think this pandemic and the impact that it's had on the way that we communicate online, how we relate to ourselves, and then of course how, um, the methods for survival of sex workers has changed. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about your conversation with Shawnee and not necessarily how you feel about it, because I would love to know, but we don't have to do that in public. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about like where it is right now for you. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's the best thing. I, like I'm not even, you know, um, trying to flatter y'all in that way, like it, it, on the fake shit. It's, I think it's great. I think the way that it's edited is phenomenal. Um, and I think the way that it's framed with the selections, because you know, each of us gave you various images. I think what you selected is dope. Um, you know, like I think one thing is well before, like I really get into just the essay, the form of how you do it, like where it, it kind of like you created your own system of metadata helps me a lot and it, it matches kind of the way that I think. So um, yeah, I think it's dope. I mean, this is one of the most important times of my life you know what i mean the work that is in this book for those who um haven't seen it or haven't read it yet i'm negotiating um i know at that time 2017 um i'm like in the middle of like doing the scariest work that's changed like a hard change of direction right because it was really so pressing about like what was just happening in uh, my life what was happening in society and it was actually mm -hmm following, you know, what would I would consider probably maybe my first wave of the black death 
uh, you know, thing. It was like years and it had just really weighed on me so heavily to where I had to like kind of go into this um, very, um, actually very scary space and create a certain kind of work that I really couldn't um, control. You know, like it was just like controlled environment somewhat, but all these variables. And then I'm also like talking about um, probably one of the more vulnerable aspects of my life, you know, being a BDSM uh, practitioner, being a part of the community, you know, um, even the images with the mask, that series is like literally the first time I ever take pictures of myself, like in my practice ever. Yeah, my titties is out. Like it's just a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah, and that that series, you know, even to this day hasn't been shown in this like, you know, and it had its own drama like that that series was censored like and pulled out of the show like you know um on queerness so i had to co confront like oh it was just a lot of stuff that was happening at that time and then you know i was heavily in conversation um multiple conversations with shawnee uh because like your actually it's your introduction at uh bruce uh what is it bruce high quality foundation place where you know you're like talking i think that's like you know i think in my life, who you are, Kimberly, is somebody who's always challenged me to think about other forms. And at that time, it was like my first presentation to really make sense of internet art. Um, and I felt I left out of there feeling that I wanted to seek out other artists and kind of really like understand them. And I think that, um, you know, what Shawnee had uh, dealt with in her life, but also her practice and using the internet space as like an actual like palette and it just it just it helped me to like expand a little bit you know even though i could never cross over and do that myself like you know in the internet but it was it's just a, it's a good more it's a good moment you know what i mean and i think that um we both are representing like our respective practices at that time and a lot has changed i think this it's wild reading this um because i've read it once and i like actually teared up because i was like i remember the fear Right. But I also remember the excitement. And, um, you know, now many years out of it, this is the work that actually broke me through. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. what I mean? it's the work uh, that um, is just like done so much stuff for my life. You know what I mean? And still doing a lot of stuff for my life, um, you know, aesthetically and pushing me internally or whatever. So it just is I, I really did like it. Like, you know, it was like it felt I was like both there, but also outside in this weird way. And, and not a lot of those things, you know, because I've had interviews or I had like texts and they don't come off that way. I feel sometimes extraordinarily violated. Um, you know, I think a lot of us as artists who deal with like very heavy conceptual practices that deal with mm -hmm. difficult material can sometimes feel violated by um, a certain heavy handedness in terms of editing. And um, mm -hmm. so it was very refreshing to have something that I knew was so permanent, you know what I mean, uh, be well situated because it was a very complicated conversation extraordinarily complicated yeah. thank you for sharing that too because i remember we we made this decision to make sure to share all the convos with you know yeah. the authors of them mm -hmm. and it was one of those things that it was just like another step that could lead to five more steps and so it was hard mm -hmm. to wrap our minds around initiating that conversation but again, it's like that practice of care, you know, like I'm so grateful that we had the, that was like important to both of us that we reached out and said, hey, this is what's going in. Is there anything that's that needs clarification? You know, I, I don't know. It makes me, I feel happy to hear that because I didn't know that that was a common experience. That's so unfortunate. Oh, yeah. It's a common experience, I think, mm -hmm. for a lot of us, especially around particular topics that can be exploited. Right. Damn. You know what I mean? So, you know, and I will, you know, I want to, you know, on record for people like, the way that y'all were checking in, I, that's why I was kind of blown away from the book because I'm like, did y'all check in like y'all did <laughs> with us, for, with everybody? Because this was a, that's a lot of time. I mean, even by, by email. And I mean, I know I tried to work in a certain way, even when I took that, like, I think I took two weeks just silent because I just wanted to make sure that it would not cause five more steps because I was trying to be considerate of like, you know, what you possibly were doing. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. it was very affirming for me. It's very affirming because it's the we first. Happy to accommodate ten more steps if you needed them. 
10 more steps, even if it was a step of sleeping and resting. Yeah. Um, no, but this is as, as also a conversation that is the first that's in a publication talking about these things. I feel very good about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, love that. I mean, I think that there's this, and like, forgive me both of you, because this is not a community that I'm a part of, but I think a lot about in the conversation, there's a moment where you talk about um, the SM community and how, you know, there can be so much time mm -hmm. in advance of an engagement. You know, you can spend weeks, months, planning how to play with someone or engage with someone for mm -hmm. 23 minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think for us, it was that kind of, that di that discipline in terms mm -hmm. of engagement that we were trying to enact. There are definitely instances where that was not possible in all the same ways, or maybe couldn't accommodate what everyone needed. And I hold mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think as editors, we really tried our best to make sure that we were doing wellness checks. And there is essays in the book that for a solid year, we chased down and, mm -hmm you know, just checking in and making sure that it came to fruition because we knew what we wanted the final product to look like. And we also knew that we wanted that kind of reaction where it's like, yeah, there's so many times where major, major, major publications take interviews, especially, and mm -hmm. completely edit everything mm -hmm. that someone has said just to squeeze in mm -hmm. to a profile or to squeeze into the kind of conversation that they want their viewers to read. And it's, it's, standard practice and a practice that I think both of us in our respective practices as writers as well just refuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to, um, you know, uh, I, I just have made it a point because I can, you know, write in those ways. I can talk in these, you know, particular ways that are maybe even read academic, you know, as a non-academic or whatever. Um, but I like to have things just sound like how I speak and, you know, and have it just the intellect rest in that place of like commonness or commonality. Um, so I think it just excelled in that because this is literally the conversation that we had. It just had to be, you know, kind of uh, tucked in a little bit because of the way that you relate when you're actually doing video. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I'm very, very mm -hmm. pleased. Thank you both you know, for the care, you know. Mm. One thing, I mean, it's tough because I, I'm grateful for Kimberly to, for, to point out there were some moments when I think the care that we had did not show up on the page necessarily. And I think those have been some of the hardest and heaviest moments to sit with. Like we maybe, I mean, there was a series of things that got cut because of just publishing timelines and turnarounds and waiting on things, or, you know, there being a miscommunication with the publishers. Like there was, there were a few, a few uncomfortable moments of, of just like, oh, well this, we didn't know if we had this, so we just moved on without it. And Kimberly and I were just like gutted. Mm -hmm. Like we pushed so hard to get this piece in the book. And now you're saying it's not gonna be in the book. And I think, you know, this feeling because the book is so big and so juicy, it's not 10 essays when when losing one would be, you know, devastating. Losing a spread didn't feel like a big deal. But I think for us, that's something we're sitting with because I think it's hard to relay that sometimes there were these lapses beyond our control. And, and I think that's something that um, is a new experience as well. For me, mm -hmm. as someone who puts things out to the world, that's if, if it happens, usually it might be like a word choice or something, maybe, I don't know, something that I'm like, can immediately be accountable for. And sometimes I'm like, but there's nothing to do, but just say, I'm so sorry, because I would feel this, I'd feel the same way, you yeah. know? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this is this is kind of a prompt, you know what I mean? Like I, like, I feel like the book in itself is a prompt to look further to like, I mean, I, I have like aggressively, you know, try to make a part of my day be like working on my own text because I was like, man, this is <laughs> this is like making me feel like I really got to catch up with my own stuff and I'm just trying to write my own stuff, you know. Um, so I think it's just a prompt, you know, like a, a, another thing that I love is um, Devin Morris's section with zines where he gets that that's that was hard. Man. Like I, I thought that was dope because that part of, you know, even in my practice, especially in research and archive. You know, we're dealing with in a culture of um, you think about black publishing, like, you know, like Brad Johnson, the figure that I really worked on a lot. Right. That I mentioned, you know, died feeling like a failure, but mm -hmm. he had a lot of publications that were in that format or what would be considered zines today that were self-published pieces by other, um, you know, a black gay men. But they also died, you know, at a time. So the rights get messed up or whatever. But. Um, and the and the book and the book dies. You know what I mean? People don't think about that, but a book can die, especially in this like transition of the 
digital age, not everything gets scanned. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it was really important to have that opportunity where you could see um, uh, zines that I'm familiar with, you know what I mean? And be like, wow, this is good for them to be locked in so people can know that this is actually still happening, you know? So Yeah, I love there's um the, I think there's Black Girls World zine, like yeah. Black Punk Rock zine, it might be the, yes. one of the first ones in the list. I was like, I remember meeting, I forget the name of the person who made the zine now, but coming across that, I was like, that is the kind of energy that I want mm -hmm. like, in the world in general, like mosh pit energy, yeah. 100%. And also just like, I'm a, I'm a record this on my own terms energy mm -hmm. um, is so vital and so critical um, because I, I think with any of these projects, like there's a glossiness, like we got Random House to publish a book, you know, like we have incredible, um, we've been gifted such incredible support throughout this process. And I want renegade responses. Like <laughs> when we were talking to Eve the day, Eve was like, I'm about to sell a bootleg t-shirt. Like I really would love to see you. The kind of like counter responses of like I'm gonna do this shit better. Please do it better. Send it to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Right. Can't wait. I would love to see it. it. Yeah, that's the best. That's the best art. You know what I mean? Like I think it's like it kind of feels like that. It's like a, a prompt. That's why I'm saying like you know if there's anything I can offer to y'all is to be be very uh, gentle with yourselves around any ideas around um, guilt or things that we don't know of that you carry with this because I think that there is so much to actually spiral out on. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And whatever is, you know, uh, not addressed here can be addressed uh, by individuals. I mean, because a book like this at this time makes room for other texts to happen. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because it is, it, it, it just shows the range and it's like undeniable. I think it kind of like disrupts the ideas of even scarcity that people have been pushing. So, I mean, you know, I think that there's a lot more, there's a lot more that will come from this, you know, mm -hmm. I mean? whether it's like critique or whatever, I think it's still good because it, we just haven't always had that space in the contemporary, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause that's the difference between this and the black book, right? The black book was important because there had to be an understanding of complicating what we have been in terms of our greatness, but also the things that we contribute, contribute and disrupting ideas of, um, you know, value at a particular time where all that was happening in the 70s is very much affected by society, right? Mm -hmm. And I think with this, artistically, it's the same kind of um, vibe is to be, uh, uh, you know, for curators, like you get this book and you understand that you need to dig deeper. You know what I mean? Like there should be other mm -hmm. artists that you're showing. You can't say that these things don't exist. Um, the writers alone, the people that you have in conversation, it's just like kind of gives people a more space. And I think in terms of the name, you know, Black Futures, it kind of prompts the prompts the um a real uh you know it's 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 action it, it has an action to it you know it's like this this is actually in in action you know? <laughs> so yeah um so i think we can maybe trade off to audience questions yeah so sure. please submit your questions if you'd like we'd love to answer them okay there's, um, I'm gonna go with the one that has the, the highest votes. Um, did black music have any influence on the creation of this book? And this is coming from Uncle Bobby's. Do you have an answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you have an immediate answer, go first and then I'll jump in. But I mean, the answer is definitely yes. Yeah, I mean, full stop, yes. Um, there are many instances of Jenna and I co-editing this book on FaceTime speaker with each other and our respective like <laughs> speakers blasting our own music. Um, and then in the book, we have this really brilliant mix uh, that was curated by King Britt, whom we love, who is a scholar of black music, a performer of black music. Um, I think Jenna's gonna drop that in the chat for you all. There's a black features mix called Today is Yesterday's Tomorrow. We have essay, not essay, we have- Talking about love. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, we have lyrics um, from Serpent with Feet's invoice. We have lyrics from Jungle Pussies, Pussy, This Pussy Don't Pop for You. Mm -hmm. um, this book is heavily influenced by the one and only Moses Sumney, Boyfriend in My Head. Um, there's so many ways that music has deeply influenced us um, and dance as well and performance as well. Um, and I think 
I also want to also call it to, um, there's this really beautiful conversation that happens right before Tiana's in the book, that's with Arthur J. Fa and Tina Kant, um, where Arthur has been in this like really beautiful crusade, having conversations about the, um, the indelible impact of black music and how he hopes to create black cinema that can mirror that power. And I think for so many of us in the book, whether we you know are aiming to or not, there's this kind of um, strong force to make that prevalence felt, like that black food, black cinema, black art, black performance can operate in the same way that um, black music has and maybe with less thiefery um, and more royalties, um, but it's definitely been an incredibly impactful force for us as humans and as editors. And underline all that, the only thing I would add is we have this incredibly cerebral essay that I haven't fully finished even reading because it's just so like galactic, galaxy. My brain is like not diluted enough to read it. Yeah, Jace Clayton, who's an incredible academic, you know, musicologist has this essay on Cardi B and the history of, of bass and also like the ways in which like that deep embodiment and like that that full juicy sound which you know needs to be heard at a high volume in the ways in which I've been weaponized against black people who want to play music in their own homes or in their cars or in a public space, you know, and it's just an incredible meditation on like the fullness of a register. And yeah, and there's like there's like an equation in there. And I'm, I mean, I love it so much. I'm like, this is great. Um, so there's that. And then one of the graphics we have, yes, keep showing it off. I love it. <laughs> Doing our own QVC. Um, there's also one of the pieces we licensed was from um, when Solange Knowles released A Seat at the Table and did all the incredible, you know, geometric spatial designs of the lyrics. You know, we, we commissioned, or not commissioned, sorry, we licensed one of those from that almost graphic novel to put in the book. And I think it was just interesting because that album was such a soundtrack and the subsequent album as well was, um, when I get home, was were such, <coughs> They just underscored so much of our lives at those periods of time. And yes, boo, I love you. Just rolling with it. We flowing. I love it. Um, and so rather than, you know, I don't know, it was just like a different way to think about the designer, Megan Tate, who worked on that. And then also the idea of the way music isn't just something we listen to, but it's this thing we experience in our minds as well. And we have that spatial relationship to it. So um, I don't know. It makes me happy. I love that question because it is making me, at first I panicked because I was, people asked like, how did you think about this in the book? I'm like scanning. I'm like, ah, but I love that question because it's making me think about all the different ways we tried to enter into what music means to us and what it means to our culture. Mm -hmm. Next question. Um, says, hi, uh, was it an easy decision to land on the book format and, or did you ever consider exhibition form or other media? And this is from Cassandra. Hmm. Hi, Cassandra. Um, we 100% never planned to do an exhibition, but it's so interesting that now that the book is out, many people have said it feels like an exhibition, which I personally am grappling with and we'll talk to my therapist next Tuesday about. Um, <laughs> but I think for us, we definitely have been trying to think, we had many iterations have been thinking about a digital companion um, just to make it more accessible to folks. Um, but it felt really important to have it be something that existed offline from its very inception. Um, and something that like would go to you as opposed to you going to it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, Jenna, I'd be curious how you'd answer that question too. I agree. I mean, yeah, me knowing nothing about art was like, maybe we can do an art show. Yeah, nothing about art. <laughs> but not I, like, I don't know that world. And Kimberly was like, no. Um, but I think, you know, it did feel like a book was vital because books travel in these really incredible ways. And even, you know, like I was saying before that a book intended to one recipient went to that person's parents and books just go unusual places. And who knows who's going to encounter that book in a post pandemic world and what child is going to be in that house and flipping through it and have a similar experience. And books were my first gateways to so many things. I, I think books were kind of how I understood the world in a real concrete, tangible way. And, you know, got glimpses of ideas, glimpses of emotions, glimpses of experiences. And of course, all of that's possible, you know, mediated through a screen these days. But I also think there's just a different, it's a book is, an, is immersive in a really different way. So it made the most sense for, I think what we were trying to accomplish 
But it's interesting to hear, I've also heard from several readers and friends who say that the going reading the book feels like engaging with art in a way that isn't um, alienating to them. Or I had one friend who I, who I think of as being someone very erudite. Like, I, I don't know, just, I don't know. And they were like, um, I, I, what you were saying before, I feel very uncomfortable going into galleries and there's something, and I also don't want to look at any artwork online anymore. Like it's very hard to digest it when it's coming through my feed. And so sitting with these images and sitting with these artists and then looking them up feels like that experience. And it's refreshing too, because so many of us haven't had even, even a casual encounter of a work of art on the street anymore because of our newfound homebound lives. So I think that's, that's kind of something I'm sitting with also. And you know, that's the thing about making something and putting it out in the world. Like you really surrender. You have no control over how people engage with it. Let you it go. To... <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. Here's a good Frozen the secret soundtrack to Black Futures. <laughs> Don't talk about that. Here's a good one. Um, Next time. Black Futures After Dark. Do you want to do this? Black Futures After Dark. Do you want to do this? I know why BBT and the country is black women. Do you want to keep it? Oh my gosh. Um, where does this book sit in a larger context of your own lives and work? <laughs> I'd be hit it from Bryce. <laughs> Mind if I spiral? Um, <laughs> um, I'll speak because Jenna spoke last. Um, unless Jenna, you want to say something? I can jump in if you're if you ready to go, then go. Okay, you want a minute? Who's next? Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to pass right now. Um, wait, what was the question again? Let me read it. Where does your book sit in the canon of your life? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, the book for me has been a full articulation of an idea. I'm someone who has a lot of ideas. Any of my editors can tell you, and a lot of them don't pan out. Like I get bored, I move on. I'm like two weeks later, I'm like, I'm done with that. Like I don't have a, a, long, a super long-term commitment to all of my ideas necessarily. And I think this book was something kind of quickly imagined that really quickly became just such an intimate part of my life. And I think it really imbued me with this sense of of accomplishment and just a new skill set. Like I just know things that I didn't know before. And so it, it's given me this boost in this way that I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I, I don't know. It's like building a chair. It's like, now I know how to build a chair and I'll never not know that knowledge and what I can do with it. I don't know. Other things are less scary now. Like other things that might feel insurmountable are less scary to me. And I think I have a lot less trepidation around embarking on something new and you know, course correcting or piloting my ship in a different direction. And the truth is I have a lot of things that I like to realize in my career and my lifetime. And I do feel like they're more possible now. And I think this book is, I'm grateful that it turned out so beautiful because it it is, you know, it's, it's a great credential. But I think more than that, I, it just gave me a sense of confidence that I didn't really have working in a newsroom or working in, you know, a predominantly white institution that has its own orientation and agenda and, and priorities many of which don't always align with mine. So I think recognizing that I I have the work that I do that that feeds, scratches a very particular itch for me in terms of why I feel committed to being in the news industry, even though it's a hellscape all the time, but it, it also allowed me to understand the ways in which my creative practice can kind of come through. And also just, you know, thinking about what it means to be an editor and, and, and having that experience because I'd only ever been the terrorists on the other side of the screen for so many years. And now I know what it's like to endure, you know, and, and to to really hold somebody's hand and, and that trust exercise and that vulnerability exercise. And it's so it's so uncomfortable to send something to an editor that's fully unformed and to trust somebody. Like here is my most nebulous self. Like what do you think? And I, I don't know. It's been such a great it's been such a great experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would echo so many of those things. I think for me, when we started this project in 2015, I don't know if I would like actually really written anything yet um, and have since developed an entire career around being a writer, which is crazy. Um, and I think for me, it was this like imbued sense of purpose and um, understanding, I think through the role of being an editor, um, 
that it was important to have your own vantage point on things. Um, because I think for a lot of my professional career, I was reading other writers to learn how to be a writer. And I think that's a very valuable practice. Um, but I think it's also invaluable to also understand your potential contributions. And I think this put the fire under my butt. And then our partnership and our friendship really put the fire under my butt, knowing that I have someone who will read any stage of a draft is a really brilliant thing to have. Um, and I think the book, the book's greatest success happened long before any of you touched it. Um, mm -hmm. I think being able to do it, like Jenna was saying, to build a chair, like we know how to build a chair now. And there were so many moments of um, just kind of like a, not necessarily, I don't want to say death because that feels too heavy, but there's so many moments where I just like killed the dream mm -hmm. and it was resurrected and um, brought back to life through our friendship and through our bond and through our sisterhood. And I think between that and then, of course, we have in the chat, there's, uh, or in viewing, there's another incredible ensemble that I'm in called the Black Art Incubator alongside Jessica Lynn and Taylor Aldridge, who run this incredible site called Arts.Black, which is an incredibly important and like just one of like it's just there's nothing else like it um black curatorial and uh critical platform called arts out black that responds to exhibition and responds to movements modernities in the arts and then of course jessica bell brown who is a curator who i've known since i was like literally my breast milk like breast milk and um having these two anchors of partnership especially 2015 2016 mm -hmm. um that made all the rest of the shit make sense. And so I feel like this book project, yeah, it was, it was, it was a success before it was really done um, because I was able to, as a person who's been very singular in my life, find community. And of course too, as well, Tiana, you know very well the impact, incredible impact you've had on my life for a very long time. So there's a lot of ways that the community of this has um, shaped things. Cool. Uh, with that said, I'm going to jump to a question from Jessica Lynn. Um, outside of this book tour, it's a very important question. Uh, outside of this book tour, what has rest and celebration look like for both of, for you both now that the book is done? Scare quotes. <laughs> mm. I can start. Um, I really love that question because even just hearing it is a reminder to slow down and take space and to rest. Um, yeah, it's been tricky. I think um, there's so many ways in which mediating through the screen is easier because I'm in jammies. I mean, from the business on the top, party on the bottom, and I love it. I love it. And what you can't see behind the screen, you don't need to know about. And there's something that I, my Scorpio self loves, but it's, it's different. It's, it's hard in a different way. And I think it's, you know, we're all grappling with anyone who's a worker right now, I think is really grappling with the ways in which the, the lines between offline and online blur, because everything is compressed into the same space and you can pretty much always be working. And I think I've had to really figure out how to exercise and build new muscle memory into my brain that just because I'm, I'm very much someone who relaxes by like eating a gummy and like looking at TikTok and just having a whole experience with myself that no one else shares. And then just being like, well, why don't you think this one's funny? And, you know, but then like, if I'm doing that and an email comes in, sometimes I'll just start responding to it out of just instinct and, and really learning to just be done. Like, We'll be done tonight just be done like make dinner put on a pod put on an episode and it's yeah it's a really bizarre reality and i think kimberly opened this combo by just saying there's a lot happening behind the scenes and i think you know it's i'm right now specifically living in this dual reality because there's a lot of um family stuff happening for me in the background and it's really 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 strange to have people be like you know, you're having this incredible experience. And like, I yes, that is actually one lever of it. There's one filter in which that's very true. And the other filter, this is one of the scariest times of my life. And so, you know, also kind of thinking about sharing an identity and I'm such a private person and it's strange to be so private and, and also have so much of my life feel very public. And so it's, 
it's like a very bizarro thing. So right now the balance is out of whack, but what I have been very good about lately though is submerging myself in really, really, really salty baths because I'm terrified of breaking shit that I don't want to replace. So I don't take electronics into the bathroom. I don't take laptops or phones into the bathroom. So it's just very much an offline time. And that has been, that has been just the thing that saves me. Oh, and then the other thing I want to say too is I love putting herbs in my water, just like whatever herbs that I have. I wanted to show this the other night and then I got cut off and couldn't do it, which made me sad. But right now I just have mint and, and lime. And it's really important if, even if you're using organic to just give them a quick rinse in the sink because that doesn't always mean they aren't covered in other kinds of sediment. I don't know. Anyway, so that's something that makes me really happy. Just herbs and citrus and plain water changes my life. One thing Jenna Worthen was gonna do is finish a thought and I love you for it. Like I was waiting for the water and I hate it. I was just I was just like, but there's this moment where you're gonna whip out this water jug and I, I don't hate, I just like hate that I knew. I love you. I think everything about what you just said is so perfect. And like you said earlier, underscore, underscore, underscore. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's wild. Like I have been in like an unconscionable amount of pain all day and I'm here with you all um, on many, many painkillers. And that's the reality of the truth of this matter. Um, but I think when it comes down to thinking about a care metric or thinking about what to do in what way is best, I think it's always, I don't know, it's always a, it's always a challenge. It's always an uphill battle. Um, I had therapy today, which felt really good to be able to just decompress with my therapist who I love very much. Um, I called on, <laughs> um, you know, community just to support in this moment. And I think it's something that I personally struggle a lot with. Um, I'm definitely a person who has to like erupt before there's care. And um, I think f in this, this week, especially, it's just been nice to be able to have yet another reason to stay in constant contact with Jenna. Um, but yeah, it's a journey. I mean, I think that anyone who tells you that it's like adequate care is a liar. Um, because we always need more and quotas are dangerous and scary. Um, but I think, yeah, I'm, I'm excited that we could hold this kind of space because it is so fulfilling and does feel so good. And even though it is work, there is so much joy and pleasure in this moment. Um, but yeah, it's fine. You know that, Jessica knows that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna, um... Hey guys, uh, I'm so sorry to have to uh, begin to wrap it up, um, but yeah, we went over our time. Oh. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to. I love the like, Apollo broom energy coming in. Like, <laughs> um, like why, guys? Uh, we did go over our time. Um, <laughs> Thank you all Thank so you much for everything. being here. This was such a like such a fulfilling conversation. Uh, I've been flipping through the book, and I just feel like it's not it's like nothing I've ever seen before. So congratulations, both of you, all of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think in a year of so much shared suffering, this is really something that we can all celebrate together. So yes. everyone, please go get your copies. Share it with your friends and family. Oh, thank you for having us, and thank you for hosting. Yeah. Thank everybody for showing up. It's so good yeah. to see you. And shout out to Philly. And shout out to Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shout out to Brooklyn. All, All right, right, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Be good safe. Night.